Um, so I do my best to follow from that great talk. Um, so, I, in fact, I am going to talk about a lot of the same issues, but we're going back in time. Uh, I'm going to talk about them by thinking about mostly the 18th century, and then I'll look back to the 20th at the end. Uh, oh, what's happening? Oh. Ah, here we are. So, this was the question that kind of popped into my inbox. Um, for today's <laughs> talk, and um, I read it, and I thought, well, obviously, no, it's not. Uh, it's also Japanese, it's Swedish, it's Nigerian, it's a whole host of other nationalities. Uh, but in fact, what I wanted to do in this talk is instead of thinking, in fact, about the diversity and the range of, of fashion across the world, is actually to question the idea of national fashion itself and to ask what we might mean by that. So could it be something that is actually autonomous, um, discrete, culturally isolated, or is it more likely to be perhaps a bit like food, something that is a hybrid, um, that travels culturally, that gathers meanings and flavors and textures as it goes? So over 2,000 years ago, the Silk Route brought not only silk but other commodities from China to Europe. Uh, and along the way, people bought and sold those commodities. They made goods out of them. They sold them on. So we have already built into the structures of fashion a kind of degree of hybridity that then often gets solidified as a kind of national myth. Um, but really, the key point is that fashion is intimately connected to international trade and that questions of style and national identities are profoundly rooted in money, uh, in commerce, and also in the geographies of power and influence. So, um, as early as the 16th century, Europeans started to, to classify fashion um, really by national type. They produced um, albums of national costume, which are very much a kind of rhetoric of us and them. And this is an Italian, Vecellio, uh, and he included European dress significantly and also a small amount of Asian and African dress in his book. But it's really important to look always at who is making this representation. Is it a representation of your own culture, or is it a representation of a foreigner? And that's really what I want to look at in possibly quite a light-hearted way um, in some of my images. But first of all, here's a great one from the 18th century. It's as if they'd invented Excel in the 18th century. I love this illustration. Um, so you might see far over on the left, the Spaniard, who is hopeless. I mean, 200 years out of fashion, terrible. Next to him, the Frenchman, possibly the most fashionable, very elegant. And you'll see halfway along, I think it's about the fifth, the Englishman also has that very English, kind of understated, sober, uh, different type of, of tailoring. He's wearing boots, not breeches. Um, that is going to become very influential across Europe. And moving you know, geographically, I think we move geographically across Europe too, because at the end we get to Turkey. So I think this kind of linear grid-like structure reflects a sort of west to east kind of interpretation of national difference. Um, yeah, let's look at the next slide. So, here, again, are two representations um, of Frenchmen. On the right, it's one made by the French. Uh, and, sorry, these are Englishmen, I should say. So you've got Frenchmen dressed in the English style, um, as the caption to this print says. And on the right, you've got Englishmen dressed in the English style. Um, so you begin to see some of the kind of hybridity and exchange that is going on. And this idea of the Englishman's dress is very influential in France, and it predates by many decades the idea of the English dandy that then becomes epitomized by Beau Brummel. But Anglomania starts much earlier than that in France. Uh, another example would be um, this three-collared coat. It's a, a design that originates in London, but it's equally fashionable in both London and Paris. And you'll see it's worn here by the Frenchman with a muslin cravat à l'anglaise. Uh, and then I'll show you just one more example uh, of a kind of hybrid fashion. So these are actually German fashions originating from Leipzig, which is a very important center for fashion at this time. Um, it's also the city in which Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther was published. And I think that also, that idea of those fashions has a really important influence at the time. 
But the reason I chose this picture is because you can clearly see the influence of French fashion in the formal dress at the top uh, and of the more understated English style uh, in the walking dresses that are at the bottom. So, so far so hybrid, and there are lots of other examples that I could have found. But what I want to do now is just go back to that idea of types that we have in our lovely 18th century Excel sheet that sort of stereotypes in this grid form uh, these national types. Because what you see is that types very rapidly become stereotypes. Uh, and nowhere more so, in fact, than in the medium at which the English excelled, uh, which is caricature in the 18th century. So this is actually an English representation of an English type, um, the macaroni or fop, who is a sort of vapid, empty-headed man of fashion, you know, terribly overdressed. But I wanted to draw your attention to the sort of um, covert foreignness of this fop. Uh, first of all, he's called a macaroni, a type of food that um, upper-class English men would have encountered on their grand tour of Italy. And as we know, pasta, of course, comes from China, so we're back again to the sort of looping in of foreign influences that then become naturalized, if you like, in the sense of national food or national fashion. Secondly, the actual stylistic origins may have been French fashion, but they're quite likely to have been from nabobs, those very rich men who came, Englishmen who came back from the East India Company in India, bringing this incredible sort of kind of orientalist sort of wealth and luxury and richness. So again, there's all sorts of kind of ideas of foreignness that lurk below the surface in what is essentially a sort of quintessentially English kind of representation. And then, moving on, um, by contrast, how do the English think of the French? So here you have in this print the bluff Englishman walking in Paris with his stick, contrasted with this very uh, effete French aristocrat in a coach with his powdered wig, and then various French stereotypes that are created. So if you go from right to left, you can see the very uncouth peasant. There's a fat monk, <laughs> priest, no, monk. Um, and my favorite, actually, is the figure on the far left, who is a hairdresser, who is so effeminate he has a parasol. You can see his scissors sticking out at the back. It's a little bit cropped. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I apologize in these sort of difficult times for showing you a sort of, I hope we're all kind of big enough to be able to cope with this sort of appalling stereotypes of otherness uh, that I'm going to show you in these slides. Uh, another example of a sort of... <laughs> The horror of French fashions in London is this lady whose, whose um, wig seems to be knocking this man off his chair uh, and terrifying the animals. And another example of a French fashion, this lady has a whole formal French garden on her head. Uh, it's a parterre, it's not an English garden by no means, and you can see it's got a little gardener and a gate and everything. So it's all pretty bad. Um, and this, again, is um, dedicated to the heads of the nation, but it's a satire on the French. Uh, the women have these very overly large and elaborate um, Apollo's knot hairstyles. The male dandies have these ridiculous hairdos, and they all have a sort of very foolish style of moving. La Poule is a reference to a kind of barnyard strut of this sort of dance that they're doing which is the quadrille, which I'm afraid is a French dance. So, moving on. Um, of course, uh, the British don't have the monopoly on stereotypes. Um, here's a, a French fashion plate. And you can see how um, incredibly um, uh, refined and kind of elegant and decorated and, and extravagant are the French women's fashions, the two figures on the right as opposed to the really strange-looking English ones on the left. So that middle figure in the grey has a sort of Puritan collar. I don't think that's accidental. Uh, and the woman to her right is almost 16th century in the fashion she's wearing. There's a very clear uh, difference made, and I think you can see it reflected also in the images of the men from the back. I think that's an Englishman on the uh, left, sorry, and the Frenchman on the right. So, um, looping back now into the 20th century, 
Um, I think the really important point I wanted to make, uh, and the more serious one, is that these ideas of national fashion are not purely cultural and they're not purely social. Um, even before the wars and the revolutions of 18th century Europe, um, they're rooted in the real economics of the fashion industries of each country. And France in particular, um, in the 18th century, um, had a very strong luxury goods industry. I mean, even before the era of mass production, it exported luxuries across Europe. Um, and it was a commercial and as well as a cultural imperative to sell itself, this notion of itself, to the rest of the world, this idea of Frenchness as intimately connected with luxury goods in the 18th century and then from the mid-19th century, as Sophie talked about, with the emergence of haute couture, which is essentially an export industry. And I think that's something that people in this country very often don't understand. They think it's just posh clothes for rich women. But it was absolutely crucial for France to sell the idea of Frenchness through haute couture um, to all these other buyers, so such as Britain or America, who were really buying for their internal markets. Uh, so they were importing those ideas. I mean, there are structures to the industry which make it very different from other ones, but that's essentially, uh, I think, the important point. So these stereotypes carry on into the 20th century. So here you have a, a French illustrated weekly um, personifying the difference between the French woman and the Anglo-Saxon woman. So you can see again, the French woman is wearing this very elegant lampshade style tunic pioneered by Paul Poiret. She's got something that's almost like an aigrette. She's got tiny dainty steps in the description. She's got very small, small feet. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon, by contrast, is kind of bigger. She's wearing a masculine tailor-made. And even though it's just a cartoon, you can see her skirt, her thigh, straining against the skirt as she takes these big steps. Uh, and there's a lot of, I, I did a lot of work on fashion modeling in this period, and there are so many descriptions of the differences between the French walk and the American woman's walk. Um, and I'll just give you one more example after the war. This is just before war. So after the war, in a really brilliant publicity coup, uh, Jean Patou imported uh, six American models to his Paris catwalk, which is a sort of provocation, really, to the industry to suggest in France that American women could do better, something that French women are supposed to be so famous for and so good at. Um, Patou, I think, was a very clever marketeer. Um, he claimed that uh, in order to sell, because to, America by then was the biggest market for haute couture, for, for um, clothing that was going to translate into factory-made clothing. So he claimed he needed this, what he called the American Diana, uh, so the huntress, the, the tall and slender Diana, as opposed to what he called the French Venus, who was supposed to be uh, more curvaceous, more petite. So we're obviously trading in cliché here, and it certainly isn't borne out by his cabin of, of mannequins, who were of all nationalities, uh, and they clearly weren't as standardised um, as he wanted to make them look. I'll just show you one more picture. Um, so those are the American mannequins. Um, the writer Colette went further in French Vogue. She calls the French models sturdy French ponies. Uh, and the Americans, she said, were like a squad of archangels poised for flight. So even a writer like Colette seems to be trading in these stereotypes, it seems to me. Uh, and they really weren't borne out by the nationalities in Patou's cabine. Um, so, to come back to the question of, is fashion only French? Well, obviously it's not, because fashion is never only one thing. Uh, national identities, I think, are not fixed but contingent. Um, but they're also determined as much uh, by how others see it as by any intrinsic characteristics. I mean, in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that, because within a couture, I think, the French have to make a story for themselves, for the French, then they have to make another story of Frenchness for export, and then the people who buy those clothes in other countries make a third story of Frenchness to sell to their local markets. And all of these accounts of Frenchness are bound up in the commercial necessity of buying and selling goods across borders. So, um, I showed you some pictures of 18th century ideals and caricatures in fashion, both English and French, and I showed you some 20th century examples. And although these stereotypes, as they become, often position French and English identities as inimical, 
I'd like to suggest that in reality, they are in fact hybrid, plural, and even sometimes opportunistic, because each borrows from the other when it suits them. Um, but at the end of the day, they are a representation, and as a representation, they are a, a type of cultural construction and an economic one. Thank you. Thank you.